Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the George Floyd murder case. Another question here, should the police officer who murdered George Floyd have been charged with first degree murder? So just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So here I'll be looking at the timeline of this case, then the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the timeline, we go to May 25, 2020, Minneapolis, Minnesota. George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man, buys a pack of cigarettes at a Cup Foods. The employees at the store believe that he paid with a counterfeit $20 bill. Floyd went across the street and got in his car. The employees evidently went to his car and confronted him and asked him to return the cigarettes. Evidently, Floyd refused, and they called 911. They told the dispatcher about the counterfeit bill and indicated Floyd was awfully drunk and not in control of himself. A few moments later, two police officers arrived on the scene. Officer Lane, 37 years old, and Officer Kang, 26 years old. They confronted Floyd. He was still in his vehicle. Floyd resisted, but he stopped after they handcuffed him. As the officers tried to put Floyd into a police vehicle, Floyd indicated he was claustrophobic and said he could not breathe. At this point, we see two more officers arrive. Officer Tao, 34 years old, and Officer Derek Chauvin, 44 years old. Evidently, Chauvin pulled Floyd across the back seat of one of the police cars, out of the door, and onto the ground. Not long after this, Chauvin puts his knee on Floyd's neck as Kang puts weight on Floyd's torso. We also see that Lane holds Floyd's legs. So we have three police officers applying force to somebody who's on the ground and handcuffed. Tao stood watch. Chauvin had his knee on Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. During that time, Floyd told the officers he couldn't breathe at least 16 times. He also said he was about to die. He specifically referred to the knee and his neck as making it so he couldn't breathe, and he asked them not to kill him. In addition, bystanders told the officers to let Floyd breathe, but the officers refused. We see that Officer Kang checks Floyd's pulse, but he's unable to find it. Even at this point, the officers did not render any aid to Floyd. They called for an ambulance first at a non-emergency level, but then upgraded it to an emergency. This whole time, Chauvin continues to apply pressure on Floyd's neck. So he did this even after they called for an ambulance and even after the paramedics arrived on the scene and checked Floyd. Floyd was transported to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead. The initial autopsy did not clearly indicate asphyxiation as the cause of death. Rather, it said that his restraint may have contributed to his death. But later we see an autopsy that confirms that Floyd died due to asphyxia due to compression of the neck. All four officers were fired the next day. Chauvin was arrested four days after the murder and charged with third-degree murder as well as second-degree manslaughter. So third-degree murder is causing the death of another in a manner that reveals a depraved mind and shows a disregard for human life. But it's done without an intent to kill. On June 3, the charges were modified to include unintentional second-degree murder. A conviction for this charge can be reached in two ways. Felony murder, so Chauvin was committing a felony assault when Floyd died, or by proving Chauvin caused Floyd's death while intentionally inflicting bodily harm. He was guilty no matter how we look at this. If he was convicted of this charge, he could be sentenced up to 40 years in prison, but the presumptive sentence is 12 and a half years. Many people have asked why Chauvin wasn't charged with murder in the first degree. In Minnesota, there are seven circumstances that qualify for this charge. Only the first item is applicable here, and that is the person causes the death of a human being with premeditation, and the intent to affect the death of the person. Now, many have said that the state would have trouble convicting Chauvin of this charge, but in watching the video, it's clear he is guilty of first-degree murder. Chauvin knew his behavior was lethal. He also had warnings from Floyd and from the bystanders. I can understand how a prosecutor who never saw the video might think that this is a second-degree murder case, but after seeing this video of Floyd being murdered, all doubt is removed. It's one of the most horrible scenes imaginable. We see four people, over the course of several minutes, murdering a man in handcuffs. If somebody was thinking this is really more of a second-degree murder case, 
they would only need to reflect on an alternative scenario in order to change their mind. If one were to imagine the same scene, except Chauvin strangles Floyd with his hands, I think most anybody would agree that's first-degree murder. Well, he really did the same thing with his knee. It caused death in the same way, asphyxiation. It really doesn't matter if somebody uses their hands or a rope or they put their knee on someone's neck. It still causes suffocation. Also on June 3, we see the other three officers were charged with aiding and abetting a second-degree murder, and they're also charged with aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. In Minnesota, to get a conviction here, we see the person intentionally aids, advises, hires, counsels, or conspires with, or otherwise procures the other to commit the crime. This is essentially a conspiracy charge, and therefore it also carries a 40-year maximum sentence. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. So what happened in this case was that four officers entered into a criminal conspiracy to commit murder. Even though this case is clear-cut, it is worth mentioning that technically these four individuals have the presumption of innocence under the law. I can't imagine what defense they're possibly going to mount for these charges, but they are entitled to their day in court. There are many surprising elements in this case. The murder was committed in broad daylight. The murderers were police officers who were on duty and responding to a call. The victim was handcuffed and unable to defend himself. The officers were in no danger whatsoever. And they committed this crime over the course of almost nine minutes. After they committed the murder, they returned to their vehicles and drove away, presumably, right? So they didn't appear to be shaken at all. They just went on their way as if they didn't just kill somebody in the street. So in a situation like this, we could be seeing traits of the dark tetrad. This construct has four personality traits under it. Psychopathy, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and sadism. I don't really see any Machiavellianism here, but we see quite a bit of the other three traits. I'll go through a few items that seem to align with these traits. Derek Chauvin was essentially expressionless as he murdered Floyd. For quite a bit of time, he had his hand in his pocket, almost like this was just a casual day at work. He may have done this to communicate how he could kill and not be distressed. This communicated how he was not afraid. He wanted to make sure the bystanders understood he was fearless. It appears that he really wanted to dominate Floyd. That was the message he was communicating through his behavior. He could have just taken his knee off of Floyd's neck at any time, but he did not want to back down. He did not want to give in to common sense, give in to decency. He didn't want to give in to the urgent pleas of the bystanders or to Floyd's urgent pleas. Floyd again made it clear that he was dying. Chauvin wasn't going to give an inch. It became a matter of proving his absolute control and domination of that situation and of Floyd specifically. He was committed to homicide and he was not going to give up. Even when the paramedics came over to check Floyd's condition, Chauvin would not remove his knee. Floyd had been unresponsive for minutes at that point. This is just utter domination. When bystanders voiced legitimate concerns, Chauvin pulled out a can of pepper spray, or whatever that was, and threatened them. They were not going to interfere with his will. It's like he was trying to prove a point. He was capable of murder, and he was going to commit murder. Chauvin's actions were sadistic. I think that's really an important part of his motive here. Chauvin wanted Floyd to suffer. Chauvin was not doing something that caused distress to himself. He wasn't keeping his knee on there because of any genuine fear. He was doing it because it was rewarding for him. That's where we get into the sadistic component. On top of that, he was narcissistic. His authority could not be questioned. Even the most reasonable and sensible pleas from the bystanders were ignored. They were almost taken as threatening by Chauvin. In Chauvin's mind, those bystanders weren't good enough to tell him what to do or to give him advice. Chauvin did not consider Floyd worthy of even the most basic human dignity. This is one of the many areas where we see the racism component, but also we see the sadism component. Right before the paramedics took Floyd away, Chauvin had to know that Floyd was dying. Even if he believed Floyd was seriously injured and not dying, remorse would have been the appropriate feeling at that time, yet we see no evidence of remorse by any of the officers. The sheer brutality of the murder of a defenseless man was frightening, as well as the ease with which Chauvin facilitated the cooperation of his criminal conspirators. Any one of these officers at any point could have done the right thing, and yet they were afraid to challenge Chauvin. 
perhaps because of an us-against-them mentality, which unfortunately is common in police departments. Floyd, and to some extent the bystanders, became the enemy, and therefore anything that they said would automatically be dismissed. These officers would not respond to reason. Their thinking became rigid and aggressive. They believed that their authority imparted immunity. If a citizen had physically intervened, they would have been arrested or worse. We know from what Chauvin did that they would have been sprayed with pepper spray. So there's really no illusion here that these bystanders could have intervened in any way, again, with physical force. Even though they were watching a murder taking place, this is the type of protection that the police have in these situations. Everyone around knows if they jump in, they could be the next victim. Now, some have said that Chauvin essentially manipulated the other officers. I can appreciate that argument, but we're not talking about something small here. We're talking about murder. If their conviction to do the right thing doesn't activate when they see somebody being murdered, when would it kick in? The reality is that they saw Floyd's life as not valuable. Again, connecting back to racism. If Chauvin had been murdering a white man instead of a black man, those officers would have stepped in to help. I think the thought process here that becomes so dangerous is beyond simply Chauvin thinking to himself, he can kill Floyd. In addition, he's thinking he has the right to kill Floyd. This murder really uncovers the horrors of racism, aggression, and the failure to assert positive values. All four of these officers failed in the worst possible way. I know whenever I talk about controversial cases, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.